It is a privilege and a pleasure to be back here with you in this wonderful Christmas weather. I just got here from Charleston, South Carolina, where it is still hot and humid, so it doesn't feel much like Christmas. So it's exciting to be here with you guys to continue our conversation on the relationship between Reformed theology and Renaissance literature, specifically as it deals with the issues of beauty and ugliness. So in case you missed my previous talk, I want to just give a brief overview of the context of this conversation. So what we're talking about is this period between the 1500s and the 1600s where ideas about beauty in Western culture changed radically. One of the things I argue is that during the Renaissance, we see the rise of this thing called aesthetic skepticism. And so for various reasons, we start to see people questioning this idea that people, one, can perceive beauty rightly, and two, can respond to it rightly. There's a lot of doubt about how human beings respond to beauty, what kind of effects a beauty has on us. Is it morally transformative? Does it make us better? Or do we just pass it by? Or worse, do we have a negative or an ugly response to it? And so there are various reasons why these, these changes happen. But I argue that Calvinism, so in Reformed theology in general, played a really powerful role in changing people's ideas about beauty. The reason is because for about 2,000 years in Western culture, ideas about beauty are dominated by Neoplatonism. And Neoplatonism is, rests on an anthropology, a view of human nature that is decidedly unreformed. So if you were to talk to a Neoplatonist in the Renaissance, what they would tell you is that, yes, sin exists. We live in a fallen world, and we are fallen people. But they imagined that sin was confined to the body. The body is corrupted, but the soul is relatively intact. And so that doesn't mean that we don't experience sinful desires or that we make mistakes, but Neoplatonists assume that at our core, each of us are oriented towards what's ultimately good, what's ultimately true, and what's ultimately beautiful. And so the way Neoplatonism imagines man, man is on a ladder ascending towards the divine. And if we use our reason and our good judgment, we will transcend the physical and our soul will be directed towards what's divine, what's spiritual, and we grow closer to God the more we experience beauty and goodness. Those are things that God uses to pull us towards him. This view of human nature and the aesthetics that it supports lasts in Western culture for about 2,000 years. But with the Protestant Reformation, specifically with Calvinism, because I think Calvinism places this heavy emphasis on the total depravity of human nature, this view of human nature just becomes untenable. And so for Calvinist man, Calvin doesn't imagine man as ascending towards God through his reason. Calvin's favorite metaphor for the human condition is a labyrinth. Calvin imagines that each of us are trapped in a maze of our own sin, and we didn't really don't want to get out of that maze because that would mean having to confront the fact that we have transgressed against a holy and virtuous God and that we would have to make changes. And so Calvin imagines man not as climbing a ladder but as falling and fallen. And without God's grace, we continue to fall further. And so Calvinism questions this idea that when we wake up in the morning, what we want most is beauty, truth, and goodness. According to Calvin, we might desire those things. We might pursue them for a moment, but it's never a sincere or wholehearted pursuit because we know where that pursuit would lead. And so rather than be wooed by beauty, rather than be awed by it, we actually rebel against it. We corrupt it, we distort it, and we reject it. And so even though Calvinism doesn't, like Calvin doesn't, you know, he talks about many, many things. He doesn't talk often about beauty unless it's the beauty of nature. But Calvin's view of human nature and the anthropology that it creates has a huge impact on English culture during the 1500s and the 1600s. And so because because of that, because there are these people who are adopting these Calvinist ideas, they suddenly experience this conflict between the model of beauty they've inherited from the Greco-Roman tradition and their Reformed theology. And what I'm arguing in my talks is, and trying to demonstrate, is how these conversations about beauty are shaped by the conflict between Reformed theology and uh, um, Renaissance literature. So one of the areas, arguably the area where this, this tension between Reformed theology and classical aesthetics, where the greatest conflict that we see is in the area of female beauty. Arguably, I don't think there was an era in human history that was more fascinated and perplexed by the problem of female beauty than the Renaissance. Renaissance uh, has a unique approach to the idea of female beauty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to share some information with you guys about how Neoplatonists thought about female beauty, and they have a unique view on it. And normally I don't read slides to my students. I feel like that can get a little dull. But I have to make a case to you guys that people in the Renaissance were weird. Right? L.P. Hartley, the novelist, said the past is a foreign country. They do things differently. 
differently there. And the Renaissance is indeed a foreign country. They do things differently there. And so what I want to show you is how people operating with this Neoplatonic assumption about human nature, this idea that we're basically our soul is virtuous, but our body is corrupt, how that philosophy, how that theology, and how that aesthetics affects how people think about female beauty and female ugliness. So many of you have probably never seen the TV show Danger Man, also known as Secret Agent. It was a 1960s spy show. I doubt anybody's seen it. Just out of curiosity, anybody seen it? Anybody? Okay, one person. Let's talk later. All right, so it's not the best TV show in the world, but it was a popular spy TV series in the 1960s with Patrick McGowan. Most of you know him as the uh, evil king from Braveheart. And so there's a, the, what's actually more memorable than the TV show is it's amazing theme song by Johnny Rivers. If you've never listened to it, I would encourage you to listen to it. And so there's a line that always struck me as a kid. And there's a line in the, in the theme song where the, the singer is warning this spy about the dangers of his life and you know all the challenges he faces in the world of espionage. And the line says, beware pretty faces you may find, for a pretty face may hide an evil mind. Now, that's a basic observation about human nature that anyone who has survived high school knows, right? If you've survived high school, you know that pretty people can be pretty on the outside but ugly in the core, right? And so this is a truth that we all know, that beauty is skin deep. We have platitudes to describe this. But what's strange is that many people did not actually believe this is true in the Renaissance. And that's what I want to walk you through is this idea about beauty, specifically female beauty that people have in the Renaissance. Because this basic platitude about human nature and the gap between the outward and the inward is actually something many people in the Renaissance did not believe. So let me, let me walk you through some Neoplatonic aesthetics and talk about what people in the Renaissance believed about these issues. So in the Renaissance, many people believed that you know, beauty and goodness are so inherently linked that in order to be, if you're physically beautiful, your soul must be virtuous as well. The two cannot uh, be separated from each other. This is a quote by Thomas Bioni, who's an Italian uh, Neoplatonist. And so he says here, among those clear lights, which in the darkness of ignorance can direct the mind of man uh, to the knowledge and magnific magnificence of our great God, the clearest and most resplendent seems to be beauty. By passing through the creatures, as it were, to many steps or degrees of nature, we should ascend to the knowledge of the supreme monarch, who with his infinite power and unspeakable wisdom can cause that ornament of beauty to shine forever. Uh, sorry, I lost my place. Who with his infinite power and unspeakable wisdom causes that ornament of beauty to shine uh, through every part, which to no other end being nature hath framed an engine so high and wonderful, then to direct us to the knowledge of those attributes which in truth are dear to him. So in other words, what uh, Bioni is talking about here is the idea of the Neoplatonic ladder, the idea that we experience physical beauty, but when we think about it, we realize that it's connected to the divine, we perceive the relationship between beauty and goodness, and so when we look at something beautiful, it draws us towards what's beautiful. This is a quote here by Baldassare Castiglione. He wrote a book called The Book of the Courtier. It's basically a Renaissance guide about how to act when you go to court, how to conduct yourself when you're in the presence of kings and queens. And so one of the things Castiglione does here is he builds on this idea that beauty and truth are you know, inextricably linked and they just cannot be separated from one another. And so Castiglione says here, there can be no beauty without goodness. A wicked soul rarely inhabits a beautiful body. And for this reason, outward beauty is a true sign of goodness. Ugliness. ugliness, on the other hand, is the dark, disagreeable, unpleasant, and sorry face of evil. In other words, if you see an ugly person on the street, walk the other way, because you know, for, you know their spiritual condition. The physical accurately reflects the inward. All right? And this idea is all over the Renaissance. Sir Philip Sidney, the famous Renaissance poet, who is a many, Calvinist in many ways, he still maintains this notion. And Sidney says in his defense of Posey, the first work of English literary criticism, he says, we are ravished with delight to see a fair woman, but we laugh at deformed creatures wherein certainly we cannot delight. The reason Sidney believes you can't enjoy ugliness is because ugliness is a sign of evil. So to enjoy ugliness would be to enjoy evil. The two go together. They can't be separated. Uh, Francis Bacon here, I won't read this quote, but Francis Bacon says, uh, ugliness is often a cause of, of, of evil because ugly people are treated badly by society, by nature, and so they have this desire to get revenge against nature. You might think of Richard III from Shakespeare's play, this hunchback who has this grievance against all of society. And Bacon makes this argument that deformed people or ugly people are, you can see their ugliness as a sign of their moral nature. These ideas go on and on, and they're all over the Renaissance. And so there's this common assumption that the physical is always an accurate reflection of the inward. 
Now, this has great implications for how men in the Renaissance think about female beauty and female ugliness. And so one of the things I want to show you is how Renaissance men place female beauty on this pedestal because of this Neoplatonic assumption about how beauty works. So here's a quote by Agnon, uh, Agnola Firenzola, who's another Italian Neoplatonist. And he writes this book uh, similar to the Book of the Courtier. It's about how you conduct yourself at court, how you, you know, operate within this world of politics. But it strays into all these philosophical discussions about beauty and uh, specifically female beauty. And so notice what uh, Agnola Firenzola is saying here about female beauty. He says, for a female beauty, uh, excuse me, for a beautiful woman is the most beautiful object, emphasis on object, one can admire. And beauty is the greatest gift of God bestowed on human creatures. And so through her virtue, we can direct our souls to contemplation and through contemplation to the desire for heavenly things. For this reason, beautiful women have been sent among us as a sample and foretaste taste of heavenly things, and they have such power and virtue that wise men have declared to be the first and best object, again, emphasis on object, worthy of being loved. So what he's saying here basically is that God's great tool that he uses to pull us towards himself is beauty. Since women are the most beautiful of God's creations, they have this special role that female beauty plays a powerful role in pulling us towards the divine and revealing God's goodness. And so what uh, Firenzola basically argues here is that what men need to do is go out and look at women. We need to spend time looking at women. <laughs> We need to look at them deeply because when we look at them, we're going to see God's glory and we're going to be drawn towards the divine. So men, if you want to try to use this, you know, you just <laughs> stare at a woman on the street and just tell her, you know, you're treating her as the most beautiful object one can admire because you really want to grow closer to God. See how it works out for you. So Firenzola continues this kind of argument. He says here, how could an earthly man ever be satisfied with the idea that our blessedness, which ought to consist above and all in uh, contemplating the omnipotent essence of God and to rejoice in our visions of his divinity, if he could not see that to contemplate the gracefulness of a beautiful woman, to rejoice in her elegance, to feast his eyes on her pleasant beauty is an incomprehensible pleasure, an indescribable blessedness, a sweetness which when it is over would like to begin again, a happiness that makes him forget himself and transcend himself. Himself. So again, this constant emphasis on observing women and using their beauty to draw you closer to God, all right? So Thomas Bioni again here talks about female beauty, and he, he comes back to this idea that if a woman is physically beautiful, you can be assured that it is a sign of her moral and spiritual virtue, and so physical beauty connects the two and draws us to something greater than itself. We see this over and over again. Here he says, the face is the true resemblance of both the beauty of the body and of the mind. The beauty of the mind is manifest in the face as it were in a clear looking glass. For in it there are seen the values of steadfastness, the true ornaments of an honest mind, the treasures of chastity, the splendors of clemency, the riches of silence, the crown of honor, the majesty of all virtue, the lodge of love, the nest of grace, the center of love, and the inestimable prize of honored fidelity. In other words, you can get all that by looking at someone's face, right? So if you look good, you are good. That is, it, it sounds strange, but Neoplatonic aesthetics maintains this view of human nature and the relationship between female beauty and goodness. And so what this leads to, everyone, in Renaissance culture is this idea that women are there primarily as objects for men to contemplate and to look at. Now, in our culture, we live in a culture that sexualizes female beauty. We live in an era of pornography. Women are frequently objectified, but it's to gratify men's lust. In the Renaissance, because of the influence of Christian culture, we don't see that. Instead, what we see is this idea that women are icons. If you're familiar with Catholicism or Greek Orthodoxy, think about the role of icons in those religions. In this culture, women are treated as icons, and they're, they're, they're held on a pedestal, but they are very much objects. Uh, the uh, film theorist Laura Mulvey said that in a patriarchal culture, women are valued for their to-be-looked-at-ness, and I love that phrase. This is something they definitely would have believed in the Renaissance, that women are there to be looked at and they are to be admired because admiring their beauty draws men closer to God. And so this is a common idea that we see about female beauty in the Renaissance. The problem is that this idea is not consistent with a reformed view of human nature. Because in a reformed view of human nature, there's this uncertainty or anxiety that fallen people cannot be trusted with beauty. 
Um, some people will be drawn by beauty for a moment, but it's not going to lead them to God. It's not going to lead them to repentance and transformation unless the, uh, the grace of God is at work inside them. And so more often than not, our response to beauty ends up being fallen and corrupted. And so one of the places, strangely enough, where we see this, this view of female beauty, which is decidedly unreformed, being interrogated is in Renaissance tragedies, specifically tragedies during the Jacobean era. So what I'm going to talk with you guys today is about one of my favorite tragedies, The Changeling by Thomas Middleton. If we have some time, I will also talk about Othello. But I primarily want to talk about Thomas Middleton's play, The Changeling, and how it interrogates these assumptions about beauty and exposes the dangerously unreformed assumptions that this attitude towards women uh, uh, is maintained in these, these views about women and female beauty. So Thomas Middleton, very interesting playwright, very dark, very grim. Most of his plays offer a decidedly negative view of human nature. He wrote one of the most popular plays of the, uh, the Renaissance. This, uh, uh, he was a huge blockbuster playwright, but his, his star has kind of faded after the Renaissance. He was not widely popular. And then recently he's had a, a kind of a revival of interest in him. So I discovered him in graduate school and he's not as consistently good at Shakespeare, but when Thomas Middleton is at his best, I think his plays are as good as anything Shakespeare wrote. And one of the things that makes Thomas Middleton interesting is he was very much a Calvinist. He actually wrote theological works where he talked about Calvinism and promoted a reformed view of human nature. And so Middleton was very interested in the dangers of living in a society where the work of the Reformation was not finished. And I think one way of interpreting his plays is that they aim at contributing to the goal of Reformation and challenging issues in his culture where he felt like there was a need to move closer to the Protestant faith. So what I'm going to do is talk with you about the Changeling and kind of walk you through this play and explain what Thomas Middleton does in this play that I see challenging this Neoplatonic view of female beauty. Just out of curiosity, has anybody read The Changeling before? Anybody? All right, one person. We'll talk later. All right, so yeah, this is an underread play, but hopefully you will go out and read it because it's, it's dark, it's grim, but it is very fascinating. So before I tell you about The Changeling, I need to tell you a little bit about the backstory. All right, so when Thomas Middleton was a young playwright, he was asked to write a mask, a, a court entertainment, for a young 14-year-old girl named Frances Howard. All right, and you can see here Frances Howard, um, she looks very much like she's up to no good. All right, and Frances Howard was, during her lifetime, the most hated woman in Jacobean society. Let me tell you why. So Thomas Middleton is asked as a young playwright to write a play for Frances Howard's marriage because at the ripe old age of 14, she was married, arranged marriage to a young man who was named Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. He was 13, she was 14. This marriage was arranged by their parents. It was very much a political union. And so after their marriage, they were separated and then it was assumed that they would grow to maturity and then they would eventually be reunited and they would consummate their relationship. Well, the problem was Frances had no interest in Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. Um, she resented her parents for arranging this marriage, and so she decided that she was going to do things her way. So while they were separated, she fell in love with Robert Carr, the Earl of Somerset. This is where it gets confusing because we've got two Roberts here, and they're also Earls, right? Now you can see he's definitely a looker. He's obviously an improvement on the other Robert. <laughs> so she clearly, she clearly leveled up here. So, if, y'all, if they had gossip columns and tabloids in the Renaissance, they would have been filled with tales of Francis. Uh, Francis had a very, very interesting uh, romantic life. So, when Francis is brought back to be reunited with her husband, she immediately sues for divorce, and she sues on the grounds that her husband has been unable to consummate their relationship. And she claims that he's impotent, this relationship cannot be consummated, and so she wants to divorce him and marry Robert Carr, the Earl of Somerset. So this causes a huge controversy because you have two powerful families who have arranged this relationship and they're trying to maintain it. And so there's this real uh, you know, court intrigue and everyone's following this case. So what happens is she claims her husband is impotent and she fills the court with all these tales about his sexual inability. It's very humiliating for him. And not to be too graphic, but at one point in the morning, he rushes out into court in his night robe, uh, or he wakes up in the morning, rushes out to show everybody that he is indeed capable of, satis you know, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. He, try <laughs> he tries to show people that he is capable of consummating the relationship. So at that point, Francis says, well, I don't know why our relationship hasn't worked out. She goes, I blame witches. I think witches are trying to keep us apart. Now this is a calculated move to draw in the interest of King James. If you know anything about King James 
King James is obsessed with witches. He believes there's a coven of witches trying to assassinate him. And so all you have to do is say, the witches are trying to do it. And suddenly King James is interested. So at one point, he tries to send Devereux to Poland to get an exorcist to unwitch himself, okay? And so meanwhile, while all of this is happening, it's widely speculated that Francis has hooked up with Robert Carr and that they've consummated their relationship. And so uh, Robert Devereux, again, not to be confused, the other Earl, he insists that she be inspected to verify that she is a virgin. He thinks this will be the, this will be the clincher. So she is brought into a courtroom. They bring out 12 midwives. They do a physical inspection and she passes. She is declared a virgin. But what's interesting is she asks to wear a mask over her face for modesty's sake. And so it was widely speculated that she is, you know, that she brought in a double who impersonated her and passed as a virgin. So, like I said, y'all, if they had gossip columns, in, gossip columns in the Renaissance, they would eat this up. Everyone is fascinated with this drama and what's going on here. So eventually, she's able to uh, annul their marriage. She's able uh, to marry Robert Carr and become uh, his wife. But one of the things that she notices while this is going on is this anonymous writer is writing all these tracks about her and talking about how evil she is how she has manipulated this relationship. One of the things this writer publishes in the, you know, what would have been the Renaissance equivalent of newspapers is that the reason she was not able to consummate her relationship with Devereux is that, or excuse me, Essex, every time he would come near her, she would just scream and berate him and punch him and hit him. And so all of this gossip is circulating. And she wonders, where is this gossip coming from? And she eventually realizes it's coming from this guy down here named Thomas Overbury, who bears a suspicious resemblance to Tom Hiddleston, if I'm not mistaken. And so, <laughs> So Thomas Overbury is a friend of uh, Robert Carr, and he is writing these tracts to try to sabotage this relationship because it believes it is hugely detrimental to his friend's well-being. And so what happens is, even though they successfully marry, Frances holds a grudge. And so she persuades King James to office, offer Thomas Overbury a diplomatic appointment in Poland, all right? Apparently, you go to Poland for everything, to get yeah, exorcisms. You know, it's a popular travel destination in the Renaissance. <laughs> and so she offers him, uh, or King James offers him this position. He declines because he wants to stay by his friend's side and try to save her or save him from this, this, this femme fatale that he's hooked up with. And when he refuses the position, which Francis knew he would, King James is offended, and so he locks Thomas Overbury in the Tower of London, all right? And so while Thomas Overbury is in the Tower of London, he continues to write tracts about how evil Francis is, and so these circulate in Renaissance, Renaissance culture. So Francis finally decides that she has had enough, so she gets her maid, and they scheme to assassinate Thomas Overbury. And they come up with what I can only imagine is the worst method of assassination you can possibly think of, a poisoned enema. That's right, a poisoned enema. Because apparently constipation was a real problem in the Renaissance. And so they get an enema and they lace it with mercury. And so they sneak it into the Tower of London. Uh, Thomas Overbury administers it to himself and then dies of mercury poison. And so on his deathbed, the pharmacist who gave her this poison enema confesses, and Francis is immediately arrested for murder and thrown in the Tower of London. But because of her connections to King James, she pulls on her status, and she is released from the Tower of London. And this causes colossal outrage, right? This is a woman of power and privilege who exploits her privilege to literally get away with murder. And so Francis is a, a, epitomizes a lot of anxieties in the Renaissance about transgressive women. These women who use their power and their status and their sexuality and their beauty to manipulate men and get away with murder. And you see characters like Francis throughout Renaissance tragedy, but in the case of the changeling, the changeling is actually based on the exploits of Francis. The protagonist, Beatrice, Joanna is modeled after this character, and she plays a really prominent role because Thomas Middleton, as I mentioned, had performed a play or written a play for her wedding. He had connections to the family. He was interested in this story. And so in The Changeling, he decided to take the, the, the Francis character and turn her into this woman, Beatrice Joanna, and tell a story. And many people have argued that the goal of the changeling is just to reaffirm men's prejudice about women, that women are manipulative, that they'll stab you in the back if you give them the knife to do it with. And she, uh, what I believe Thomas Middleton is trying to do here, because he's a Calvinist, is actually challenge men's ideas about women. He's not trying to say that there aren't women like Francis or Beatrice Joanna out there, but what he's trying to do is expose the dangerously unreformed ideas, the Neoplatonic models of beauty that men use to try to make sense of women. So in the opening of the play, it it's set in Catholic Spain, 
and it takes place in a chapel. And so in the chapel, two, the two main characters enter, Alcimero, who's a wealthy Spanish nobleman, and Beatrice Joanna, and they're both there to pray. And so they're in this Catholic chapel praying, and they notice each other, and they immediately fall in love with one another. And Alcimero, who's never known Beatrice Joanna before, never met her before, immediately approaches her, declares his love, and you know, wants to marry her. And she cautions him, and she, using very Neoplatonic language, she tells him, our eyes are sentinels to our judgments, and should give certain judgment what they see, but they are rash sometimes and tell us wonders of common things, which when our judgment finds, they check the eyes and call them blind. In other words, don't jump to conclusions. You're looking at me, but you're not. Make sure you're really seeing me. And so Al Samaro immediately declares, how can he not love her because she's so beautiful? And he's operating with this Neoplatonic assumption that beauty is indeed a, a sign of virtue. And so if she looks good on the outside, she must be beautiful on the inside. And so based on this assumption that he pursues her, she falls in love, and they decide to make plans to get married. There's a problem, though. Her father has already arranged for her to marry Paracuo, another Spanish nobleman, and he he wants this marriage to go forward for political reasons. And so Beatrice Joanna decides that she will take things into, uh, she will take charge of the situation herself, and she will make sure she marries the man that she wants to marry. Now what's interesting about this scene, because it takes place in a Catholic chapel, is it, it calls attention to our, our, our scene, it calls attention to these, this unreformed space, and these unreformed characters, and how they look at the world. Now if you know anything about Renaissance vocabulary at the time, uh, the name Beatrice Joanna is interesting because Beatrice means blessed. Joanna, though, is a common Renaissance phrase. It's slang for a prostitute or a whore. So literally, her name means the blessed whore, all right? So this is very much a judgment of her as a character, all right? So Alcimero sees this woman, falls head over heels in love with her, and she decides that she's going to do, very much like Francis, she's going to make this relationship happen. So the question is, how is she going to get rid of her unwanted suitor? So she turns to her servant, De Flores, who is uh, marred by some sort of undefined skin condition. Condition. Throughout the play, they talk about how hideous he is. Everyone who comes near him is repulsed by his physical appearance. So this is a really fun role to play because you gross out everybody when you're on the stage. And so what Beatrice Joanna decides is that she will simply pay De Flores to commit murder. And so she pays De Flores to go out and kill Paracuo. And there's a great scene where they go down in the basement of the castle and he guides Paracuo through this dungeon and then he stabs him and then cuts off his finger because it's a Renaissance tragedy, it gets real bloody, and then he hides the body. And so what Beatrice Joanna imagines is she's paid a servant to commit murder. She's gotten rid of an unwanted man, much like Francis. And now she has uh, the freedom to marry the man that she wants. But what she doesn't anticipate is that De Flores is obsessed with her in a very toxic and unhealthy way. And so by hiring him to commit murder, she's placed herself in a very delicate position where he is in a position to blackmail her. And De Flores very much uses this position of power. And he tells her, I don't want your money, what I want is you. And in order to keep me silent, you have to have sex with me. This shocks Beatrice Joanna. And in the same way that the men in the play judge women with a very prejudiced view, do, uh, Beatrice Joanna judges the different social ranks with a very prejudiced view. The idea that someone from a lower social class would dare to sleep with her is offensive to her. And there's a great line in the play where she says, what you're asking would contaminate me. And De Flores basically responds, a woman dipped in blood and you talk of modesty? And what's so strange is Beatrice Joanna has such a, a, a naive view of herself. She's literally murdered a man, but she doesn't see that as an act that has corrupted her. What she believes would corrupt her is to have sex with someone who is a lower on the social ladder than she is. And so De Flores puts her in this situation where in order to maintain her happiness, in order to maintain this image that she's created for herself, she has to sleep with him. And so in this very religious language, De Flores tells her, you are, you are depraved, you've lost any innocency you've had, and now you are mated with me, and we belong to each other. And so in this weird kind of reversal of romantic and theological language, the two end up in essentially a quasi-marital relationship. And what Beatrice Joanna initially tells De Flores is, you are so hideous, you are so repulsive, morally, socially, physically, there's no way I could possibly love you. But then De Flores has a line that's very chilling. He basically says, you will learn to love soon what right now you fear to enter. And so what the play shows is that this is actually true. 
And Beatrice Joanna turns to the audience in a very chilling scene and she says, I'm in a labyrinth. And of course, for me, that's a charged term because that's John Calvin's favorite metaphor for the human condition. And Beatrice Joanna has schemed and manipulated things and she thinks she's going to be able to guide herself through this labyrinth. But when she comes into relationship with De Flores, she realizes she's trapped. And in order to have what she wants, in order to have Al Samaro, in order to have her marriage, in order to be free from her father, she has to endure De Flores. And like I said, De Flores tells her, you think this is going to be hideous, but you're actually going to learn to love me. And what's shocking in the play is that that actually turns out to be the case, because De Flores and Beatrice Joanna are actually very well matched for each other morally. De Flores is weirdly the most sympathetic character in the play because he makes no pretensions about his morals. He knows he's wicked, and he embraces that. And so what happens over the course of the play is Beatrice Joanna and De Flores have to commit a series of murders to maintain their image. They have to protect themselves by murdering other people. So at one point, Beatrice Joanna discovers that Al Samaro, much like Francis uh, Howard, is once before they get married, he wants to administer a virginity test to make sure that she's still a virgin. And so she hires her maid to pass as uh, her in the darkened wedding uh, a, a bridal chamber. And so she's able to get her maid to sleep with her husband. And he thinks that he slept with uh, Beatrice Joanna and everything's okay. But now they have this maid who can talk. So then they have to murder her. Well, in order to murder her, they have to burn down the castle, and then things spiral out of control as they have a habit of doing in Renaissance tragedies. And there's this great scene where De Flores turns to Beatrice Duane and said, I would do anything to protect you. Tell me who you want me to kill. Tell me who you want me to murder. I will do anything for you. And she tells him what to do, and he runs off to do it. And she turns to the audience, and she says, look upon his care. Who would not love him? The East is not more beauteous than his service. And this is a very strange line in this play because it calls attention to Beatrice Joanna's aesthetic judgment, which challenges everything the Renaissance believes. Remember Sir Philip Sidney, you can't enjoy ugliness because ugliness is a sign of evil, all right? But what Calvin believes is that we frequently do enjoy ugliness because our loves are not ordered rightly, our, our desires are not ordered rightly. And so fallen people frequently enjoy things. We find things beautiful that are not beautiful. And what we see in this play is how Beatrice Joanna's aesthetic judgments change. And by the end of the play, she's operating with this mentality that in order to protect herself, she needs De Flores. And so therefore, De Flores is beautiful. Everything he does is wonderful to her. And you see this character's prejudices and assumptions gradu gradually change over the course of the play. And this person that she despises at the end of the play, she eventually comes to love. And what's fascinating is she turns to the Renaissance audience and asks them to agree with her, to come to the same conclusion. Now, of course, of course they want it. But what it makes you wonder is, what is her aesthetic model? What is the, the standard of judgment that she's using? And based on her circumstances, is it right? Is she right to believe that De Flores is beautiful in a sense because of what he's doing for her? And so at the end of the play, when Beatrice Joanna's a true moral ugliness is exposed, her husband, Al Samaro, is shocked. He doesn't know what to make of this. Al Samaro is a Neoplatonist. And remember, at the beginning of the play, he tells her, I'm looking at you rightly because my eyes are seeing you as you truly are. Your beauty is a sign of your goodness. And so at the end of the play, Al Samaro is shocked to discover his wife's moral ugliness. But what vexes him is that he can't get past the fact that she still looks beautiful. And so he alternates between these very contradictory speeches. At one point, he says, I suspected this. I feared from the very beginning that you were morally deformed. But that raises the question, if he feared that, why did he go ahead? Why did he, Beatrice Duana actually cautioned him, don't be rash. Why did he pursue this? And so then in another line at the end of the play, he says, here's beauty changed to ugly whoredom. In other words, you used to be beautiful, but now you're ugly, inside and outside. But that's totally inconsistent with his aesthetic model, with his Neoplatonic assumptions about how beauty works. And so as the play progresses towards its climax, Al Samaro's view of Beatrice Joanna just gets more and more conflicted. He starts to face things that are utter nonsense. One of the things that stands out, he says, oh, cunning devils, how should blind men know you from fair-faced saints? Now, let's do a close reading of that line for a second. Think about this. What he's, he's talking about Beatrice Joanna, and he's talking about Al Samaro, and he says, how could blind men tell the difference between you and saints? Because you both look virtuous. 
But the word blind is telling there because blind people, by definition, cannot see the physical. So blind people are not in a position to discern anything rightly or wrongly from the physical. And so Al Samiro's judgments about beauty just become more and more nonsensical because the model he's used to make sense of women, to make sense of the world around him, has imploded. And at the end of the play, his greatest concern is the fact that this woman he is now married to is so rotten to the core but yet she still looks beautiful, and he can't get over the fact. that he, he almost assumes that her physical appearance should change in front of his eyes, but it doesn't. She still looks good on the outside, but she's rotten to the inside. And so what we see here in this, in this play is this critique of the neo -mod neoplatonic model of female beauty, this idea that the physical always reflects the inward. And so there's a, actually a, a line that comes from Al Samero, and he points out there is scarce a thing but is both loathed and loved. And what he basically means there is what one person hates, another person can love. And he suggests that even though he doesn't really know it, that our standards of beauty are not really about our rational judgments about what's good or true, they're about our personal needs and our personal desires. And we end up finding things lovely or wonderful or good that end up gratifying our desires. And this is much more consistent with a Calvinist view of fallen nature, that people are not oriented towards what's true and good through their reason alone, apart from the grace of God. We, what we call beautiful, what we call wonderful, what we call good is a reflection of our own fallen desires and our need to justify that to ourselves. And so in The Changeling, we do see this transgressive woman. She's radical, she does a lot of horrible things, and in many ways she, she imitates Frances Howard and reflects those, those Renaissance hang-ups about transgressive women. But at the end of the play, the emphasis to me is not on Beatrice Joanna, it's on the men around her who fail to see her for what she is because they operate with this neoplatonic model of beauty. And because of that, they, they make these basic mistakes about human nature, that the outward reflects the inward, and vice versa. And so at the end of this play, we have this, this challenge, this tendency to use women as a model of beauty, to treat them as this object that brings us closer to God. One of the things I find is that Renaissance tragedies often equalize men and women, not by elevating women, but by lowering men. They emphasize that both men and women are totally depraved, and without God's grace, both men and women make bad judgments. We make bad aesthetic judgments, we make bad moral judgments, judgments, and that what the, how we view the world is oftentimes more a reflection of our own fallen nature than it is the world itself. And so what uh, Thomas Middleton does here in this play is he takes this very topical event in his culture, this transgressive woman who is inspiring a lot of misogynist discourse on you know, women and women's nature, and he redirects the focus to men and calling men's attention to their own re unreformed views of women. And I think he basically asks the men in the audience to think about, in what ways do you act like Al Samaria? In what ways do you look at women in this unreformed way? And in what ways do you treat women as you know, uh, uh, icons of virtue that are there to bring you closer to God? And by doing so, he questions these narratives, these aesthetic models, and he brings this attention back to the inward. To me, that's the traditional function of Renaissance uh, literature when it operates from a reformed perspective, is it makes you aware of your own inward state. And so it brings this attention back to subjectivity. And so we, I think we say two things that make this play very interesting. One, we have a powerful, transgressive woman who asserts her own judgment, and rather than adopting the role that men have given her, she does her own thing. And it's tragic. It brings her to a, a, a very gruesome end. But she gets the opportunity to call attention to the fact that women are subjects. Stephen Orgel said the greatest anxiety of the Renaissance is that women are not objects but subjects, not the other but the self. And so here in The Changeling, we see this woman pushing back against this idea that she is just an object for men to use and control. She tries to assert her own destiny. But because she has fallen, because she's depraved, she descends deeper into a labyrinth. The more she tries to assert herself, the more she goes into a labyrinth. And so a Renaissance audience could walk away from The Changeling with these very un, you know, prejudiced views of women. But I think Thomas Middleton gives the audience reason to consider to what degree are we like Beatrice Joanna? To what degree do we have these fallen views that lead us further into these Calvinist labyrinths? And we see that the men in the play, though they don't murder and kill, or at least Al Samaro doesn't murder and kill like Beatrice Joanna, he has an unreformed view of female beauty, and it leads him to make tragic and self-destructive decisions 
while all the while convinced of his own rightness. And so at the end of the play, I think we're left with these questions about goodness and virtue and how we think about beauty when we think about it from a reformed perspective. And so rather than you know, maintaining simple misogynistic assumptions about female beauty, I think this play gives people reason to walk away and question their own aesthetic judgments and to what degree our views about beauty are related to our moral condition. And so I think this is one of the things the changeling does to challenge these things. Okay, yeah, so this is, I think, a recurring emphasis, y'all. Like I said, in the Renaissance, there's these, these, uh, this very, very strange assumption. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. In the Renaissance, what they do differently is they assume that the physical is an accurate reflection of the inward. And so what you can do is you can look at someone's face and you can figure out the state of their soul. Renaissance tragedy takes this argument and deconstructs it. If you've ever read a Shakespearean tragedy, you know one of Shakespeare's greatest themes is that the outward does not reflect the inward and people can pretend to be things they are not. You may remember the famous line from Hamlet, oh, that one can smile and smile and be a villain. Like I said, if you've survived high school, you know that's true. But people in the Renaissance did not cling to this truth, right? They rejected common sense because so many of them operated with a Neoplatonic assumption about beauty and how beauty works. And so one of the things that I think is interesting is how these Renaissance tragedies take women that are radical, that are transgressive, and they use them to deconstruct ideas in the culture that are decidedly unreformed. Today, I talked with a group of students at Whitehorse Hall about Euripides' Medea. If you've read that play, you know it's a gruesome play about a woman who murders her own children in order to make a political statement. Um, we, I remember a few years ago, I watched, went to see a movie, Gone Girl, which is probably one of the most uh, influential femme fatale movies made in the last few years. And the guy in the ne theater next to me turns to me and goes, I guess I should be nicer to my wife. You never know what women are capable of. <laughs> and I thought, what a strange line. But transgressive women have a habit of perplexing us. They have a habit of challenging our interpretations about who people are and how we operate in the world. And so in The Changeling, I think we see Thomas Middleton and other Renaissance playwrights take women like this and they use them. I don't think they use them just to reinforce prejudices about women, though those were certainly common in the culture. I think they use them to make viewers or playgoers aware of their own inward condition and to make us think, to what degree do we judge beauty like Beatrice Joanna? Are we guided by reason and truth? Truth, or are our aesthetic judgments prone to shift as often as our desires and our, our, our situations change? And that when we say something is good or something is beautiful, we're actually not saying something about the object, we're saying something about our own fallen condition. And because uh, the dominant aesthetics of the Renaissance are so governed by these unreformed ideas, I think that reformed playwrights uh, like Thomas Middleton use these plays to jump in and engage these, these ideas and to really interrogate them and deconstruct them so that when you walk out of the theater, you wonder not just about other people, but you wonder about your own state and how your judgments about reality reflect your spiritual condition. I believe that's what the goal of the changeling is supposed to be. Thank you. Could you say a little bit about tragedy in general? Um, you know that there's a, there's a debate about is, Christ, is there such thing as Christian tragedy? Um, can can uh, there even be a Christian tragedy. It sounds like you're saying yes. Is it the same as ancient tragedy like Medea or an Oedipus? Is there something different and unique about uh, this period with, with tragedy? That's a great question. Actually, uh, we were having a talk with some Whitehorse Hall students today about that, and I think one of the things we discussed is that Greek tragedy, because it, it's consistent with the Greek worldview, tends to invoke these ideas of cosmic forces that are beyond our control. And so I think a recurring theme in Greek tragedy is embracing the fact that your destiny is not in your own hands. Uh, you're, you're living out the will of the gods and you, you don't always know what that will is. I think Renaissance tragedy tends to reject these ideas of you know cosmic forces controlling what happens to you and to tends to put more emphasis on individual human decisions. And so in Hamlet or Macbeth or Othello or the Changeling or the Duchess of Malfi, I think a recurring uh, theme we see is critiquing the character's decisions and trying to figure out what errors they made along the way that led to this pathway. So I think uh, Greek tragedy emphasizes fate. I think Renaissance tragedy tends to put greater emphasis on choice and critiquing the moral and aesthetic judgments that lead people into their labyrinths. Good. And uh, how would you, if you could bring Shakespeare into this, I know there's a lot of questions, so we'll get right to you, but uh, how would you bring, what, what Shakespeare play would be the first one you'd want to talk about, given your talk here on, on Thomas Middleton? 
Well, in my book, I t- or in my book chapter, I talk about uh, Othello in relationship to this play because a common assumption about Othello is that even though uh, Desdemona is a victim, even though she's slandered and lied against, that there was so much misogyny and racism in the in the Renaissance that uh, Renaissance audiences would have assumed she got what was coming to her because she had the audacity to go against her father, she had the audacity to marry a black man, and so she got what was coming to her. And that's a very common interpretation. Uh, of Othello, even in today's you know uh, literary criticism, and so I think what's interesting is I, I believe that Shakespeare's sympathies are very much with Desdemona, and he shows how um, Othello's corrupted view of Desdemona leads him to betray and ultimately murder his wife. And so what I think is interesting is both Desdemona and uh, Beatrice Joanna are treated like these icons of virtue. And the, rea- this, the irony is that Beatrice Joanna is very much not virtuous, whereas Desdemona is virtuous. And when she's slandered, one of the, the things uh, that most upsets Othello is that he can't figure out why she doesn't look ugly to him. And he talks about how her soul is a black weed, but she still has a beautiful, fair face. He expects some somehow this transformation um, to occur in his, his assessment of her beauty. And so that, to me, reveals that kind of neoplatonic understanding of what women are supposed to be. And I think that the play, it, it's, it's, it has a very different female protagonist, but it both plays, I think, are critiquing that kind of unreformed view of uh, female beauty. OK. I want to keep asking questions, but I know I need to hand it over. Yes, I'll bring the microphone to you. Thank you for your thank you for your lecture, Dr. Jeffries. Um, how did the Renaissance um, thinkers or playwrights uh, deal with the fact, like articulated at the end of Proverbs, where pride is uh, charm is deceitful and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised? So when a woman gets older and starts to lose some of that beauty, did they view her soul to be like slowly corrupting as well? You know, you'd think that some people in the Renaissance had never read the Bible, based on you know some of the, but. It's, it's obviously how they interpret that. So one of the, the recurring themes that we see in f- discourse on female beauty is this idea that female beauty should outwardly mirror the inward nature. And so in some cases, it's this idea that, you know, that it's just if you are beautiful on the outside, you're beautiful on the inside. But in other cases, we see this emphasis on that women have an obligation to act in a way that reflects who they are. Um, so um, this reminds me of the line in you know, Hamlet where he rebukes women for painting their faces. Um, the Renaissance famously hated cosmetics um, because Renaissance women, at least in England, tended to be very fair. And they would paint their faces. And so you could, if, you, if you blushed, you couldn't tell if a woman was blushing because of the rouge that she was wearing. And so this was one of those things where they assumed that if a woman was virtuous and someone said something that was offensive or you know, uh, you know, wrong, she would blush as an act of modesty. And so this was this anxiety that because of cosmetics, people could no longer accurately read the face. And so there are these obvious verses in the Bible, you know, just common sense experiences that tell us the outward and the inward not go together that way. But the Renaissance seems to have neglected that in many ways. And I think it's just because of the prevalence of Neoplatonism and this assumption that beauty and goodness are still bound together in a fallen world. So. Um, thank you for your lecture. I was wondering if, um, so there are obviously things that today's culture gets wrong about female beauty. Were there any things in the Renaissance that were potentially more right, th- uh, more correct than the mainstream today? Um, is there anything we can learn from them amidst all of the mush? I would say where areas where we see people breaking from the Neoplatonic model, um, that we see a, a lot of growth. So I think one of the things, you know, I quoted Stephen Orgel, and he says the greatest anxiety of the Renaissance is that women are actually people. Uh, I think he's exaggerating, <laughs> but that is, a, that is a real anxiety for many people, but for other people, it's a cause of celebration. So I think, of, um, I think Protestantism places a heavy emphasis on marriage as, a, as an institution of equality, finding people who are your soulmate, because, you know, in a patriarchal society, you're married off to someone that your father believes will be be a good political or social match. But in a the, the Renaissance, our people have argued invents the idea of companionate relationships, and that you should be married to someone who is indeed a companion to you, someone who will help raise you up and guide you and be a helpmate to you. And so that's a common emphasis. And so what I think we often see Renaissance tragedy playing with that, Beatrice, Joanna, and De Flores, they're like a depraved inversion of that. They're actually perfect for each other, but rather than being virtuous and good, they're rotten to the core. Or I think I, I would argue 
the most loving and supportive relationship in all of Shakespeare is Lady Macbeth and her husband. They're rotten to the core, but they, they act for each other's good. And so I think we see this kind of inversion of that in those tragedies, but the positive version of that I think is heavily emphasized in culture. So I th I'd say that's a positive that we see coming out of these cultural changes. Thank you for speaking. Would you all at all connect the idea of knightly courtly love to this neo-Platonism like, idea where the knights would pursue an unattainable, like beautiful woman who was often married to almost complete them and to dedicate their tasks to? Yes, I would say that uh, courtly love rests heavily on neo-Platonic assumptions about beauty, the body, sexuality. C.S. Lewis talks about this in his book on courtly love, that um, one of the key components of courtly love is adultery, and that uh, knights were encouraged to form romantic connections to women, and that provided it didn't turn to lust, as provided it didn't turn to something physical, that that's actually acceptable because it would inspire them to go out and do great acts of valor. And so that's that kind of Neoplatonism walking the tightrope, right? Where you're, you're treating women as, uh, you're treating them as objects, but they're there to inspire virtue, not lust or personal gratification. So I think uh, a lot of medieval romances delve heavily into these ideas about female beauty, and then we see those recycled in re Renaissance poetry and, and, and writings on you know beauty, and then a, a tragedy seems to be the weird place where people go to critique these ideas. I imagine Shakespeare and people just sat around making fun of the Middle Ages and you know things like that, and they use their tragedies to deconstruct a lot of those ideas. Um, you were talking about Othello and how um, Othello is surprised by um, Desdemona's beauty um, when uh, he believes her to be wicked, um, but Desdemona is actually innocent. So could you ex um, expand on how um, Shakespeare is challenging that Neoplatonist view of beauty? So basically Othello treats Desdemona as an icon, right? He treats, he treats her as if his salvation depends on her. And Iago realizes this because he says, if I can get him to turn against his wife, he will reject his baptism, he will reject his salvation. And he realizes that Othello's whole religious life will implode if his view of women is changed, right? And because Neoplatonism rests on that assumption that if you look good, you must be good, it's very easy to exploit that and manipulate that. And so when Iago is able to manipulate Othello into believing that his wife is you know, unfaithful, adulterous, it causes this real conflict. And I think a lot of Othello's uh, anxiety is trying to reconcile how his wife can still look so beautiful but he, she can be so wicked. Now, of course, she's not wicked. She's, she's still faithful to him, but it's his perception of things. It's his bad moral judgment as well as his bad aesthetic judgment. And so because he treats her as you know, this, this, this mediator, this spiritual mediator, and so much of his religious hopes are bound up in her, Iago knows if he can change Othello's view of a woman, he can destroy him. And so I think that's what Shakespeare is trying to do, is challenge this, this tendency to treat women as the ultimate force of divine goodness and beauty that draws us closer to God. If you have that assumption, it will be dashed the first time you go on a bad date. Um, one, real quick, so on Iago, one of the you know one of the questions is what's motivating him. Yeah, he says at one point Cassio's life has a beauty to it that makes him ugly. <laughs> it, do you think he's motivated by the his inability to get close to that beauty? I hadn't thought about that line, but I would imagine that is, that is at the heart of this, right? Because Iago's motives are you know always in question. I think he like I think he has a plethora of motives that he tries to hide. Um, but yeah, I think he I think he despises. Othello's closeness to his wife and the way he treats his wife as this object of virtue. And it, deny, it basically denies her that she's a person, that she's just there for Othello to mediate between him and the, and the, uh, the Venetians. How does the Renaissance how does the Renaissance idea work with um, the Fairy Queen and how Spencer writes Duessa as opposed to Una? Because she does appear to be beautiful, but in reality, she is one of the ugliest, uh, ugliest women in the in book one. 
I think Spencer is a, a staunch Calvinist, and so Spencer assumes that they, the exterior does not have to match the interior. And the key virtue to me in the Fairy Queen, at least in book one, is discernment, because you can't be holy unless you can discern what things are versus how they appear to be. And so the lesson that Red Cross Knight has to learn is that there are women and people like Duessa who are rotten to the core, but have these beautiful exteriors. And so that, to me, is a very, it's a, it's a work that encourages aesthetic skepticism and encourages people to realize that we may not judge beauty rightly or respond to it until we start to approach things from a reformed, sanctified perspective. And so that's what, in the tragedies, we don't see, we so often don't see men who operate or learn those kind of lessons that we see Red Cross Knight learning in The Fairy Queen. Uh, but in The Fairy Queen, doesn't ultimately Duessa's outward appearance line up with her inward appearance or with her inward virtue or lack thereof? That's true, yes. You know, she does turn out to be quite ugly when her exterior is revealed. And so I, I would say that Spencer, you know, Spencer recognizes that there this can be this correlation between beauty and ugliness, but he also realizes that what we see as beautiful, what we perceive as beautiful, is, is, is often distorted by the fall. And I think that's the lesson that Red Cross Knight has to learn. Whereas Una is both physically beautiful and beautiful spiritually, there is this link between that. So there may be some Neoplatonism going on there, but there's a, there's a in, in the world of the Fairy Queen, appearances are always deceiving. And so you have to discern the truth of things. And that's, um, I would say that, you know, the difference is that the Fairy Queen, it's an allegory. So things are not gonna work as neatly, or things are gonna work a little bit more neatly than they do in the tragedies. So uh, in the Amoretti by Edmund Spencer, he's uh, pursuing this woman who is very cruel to him and is very arrogant. And by the end of the sonnet cycle, you really hate this woman. Uh, she's very, she's, she's very uh, conceited, and vain. Um, but at the same time, there are part, there are some, some of the sonnets praise her physical beauty. Uh, but the the speaker of the sonnets continues pursuing her, even though she's cruel to him. Uh, and he's and she's beautiful. So th there seems to be a weird tension going on there. How, how would you explain that in a reformed interpretation? So I would say that a recurring theme, you know, of course the sonnets go back to Petrarch and his, his love for Laura and you know, this this unrequited love, that's a recurring theme in, in the sonnets. But one of the things Renaissance sonneteers often explore is, is the beloved actually worth loving? In other words, is the is the fault the the woman or is it the man who's obsessed with her is the tension in the relationship perhaps his own obsessions his own just twisted desires i think we also see this in shakespeare's sonnets where the the sonnet here becomes obsessed with the dark lady who he both loves and loathes and one interpretation of the sonnets is it's critiquing this kind of toxic obsession with other people where we raise other people and put them on a pedestal but the reality is they actually Actually don't have the traits we imagine they don't have the the beauty or the goodness that we imagine but we simply perceive that because of our own fallen state so I think that that's one of the things uh, romantic sonnets do is they allow you to look inside people's love lives but also into their psyches and figure out just how twisted people can be and so oftentimes our judgments about what we think is beautiful or good are actually quite distorted and this is that's to me is the complete opposite of the neoplatonic model because it assumes that if people are thinking rationally they're always going to be drawn to what's good, they're always going to be drawn to what's beautiful. Uh, Baldassar Castiglione basically says this in the book of the Courtier, that he says, if you think a woman is beautiful and then she turns out to be morally corrupt or something like that, he said, look at her again and you realize, you'll see her as ugly. Like if you think about it rationally, her physical appearance will change in your eyes because you'll see her for what she really is. And of course, that we don't live in that kind of world, but Neoplatonists imagine they do. So I think a lot of uh, sonnets, uh, whether it's Spencer or Shakespeare, delve into these issues and critique that kind of thinking. Uh, okay, so in, in, um, in the Victorian era, there's this ideal of the woman as the angel in the house, the, the person who, like, uh, the, the man is this base entity and he comes home and his wife is supposed to, like, basically sanctify him. So I guess I'm wondering, um, did did the Neoplatonists win? Um, if the if the ideal later in history became 
uh, more similar to the courtly, sort of more similar to the courtly love tradition than to the um, Calvinist tradition. In one, maybe in a sense they did. So the Angel of House comes from a poem by Coventry Patmore where he talks about his ideal woman who's his wife. And there's a really disturbing line where he says, you know, an, a good wife would not even raise her hand to defend herself if her husband slapped her. She'd simply just look at him with sad puppy dog eyes and then he'd feel guilty and he would become a better person. And it's really, it's, it's basically a Victorian guide to being a doormat. Uh, and Virginia, Virginia Woolf said, my goal in life is kill the angel in the house. So in that sense, I, I would say it's the same kind of Neoplatonic thinking. And that, that thinking is very misogynistic because it treats women as objects for men to use and that women are there to make men better. And I think that you know, in a reformed you know, aesthetic which recognizes that women are people and they can be fallen, they can do fallen things, but they are also, God's graces at work in them just like men, it, it should challenge that. So in the Victorian culture, I definitely, see, we, I definitely would agree that we see these kind of ideas being brought back though I don't know that people would have attributed them directly to Neoplatonic influences. Um, you mentioned that Francis, Francis Bacon thought that ugly people were evil because society treated them badly. Was this a typical way of thinking about it, or did others think that evil people were ugly? So, like, what comes we first? See, yeah, so Bacon's view is, is nuanced, because he doesn't assume that your ugliness, that moral ugliness causes physical ugliness, but he assumes that if you're born ugly, you're born with a deficit, and you're going to resent it. And we see this with De Flores. Everyone in the play treats him horribly. Um, in fact, Al Samaro sees him at one point and says, I wish I could just stab him. Like, I just, I see him and I just want to stab him. I don't know why I hate him. But then he actually says, he was like, I wouldn't want to get my blade dirty with whatever he's got going on. So that's kind of how Bacon imagines society treats the ugly. And so he says, if you're treated that way, you can't help but not become evil. So Bacon's a little more nuanced, but he realizes that, you know, basically he says, if you see an ugly person walking down the street, you can just assume they've got a grudge, you know, and you don't trust them. So it's, it's, it's still in the same vein of thinking, I would say. And I, I think that idea is common. Um, most, I would say most of Shakespeare's you know, ugly characters tend to be villains. I'm thinking of Richard III. Um, the people who have some sort of deformity or ugliness tend to be vicious. And that's what Bacon says, is that ugliness requires you to be vicious. If like, life treats you cruelly, you have to be cruel to life. How did the ideal of to be looked atness in the Renaissance time possibly lead to today's um, sexualization of women? Do you see that as really something very different, or could it have led to it? I would say they're just two sides of the same coin, um, that Renaissance women are treated as icons of virtue. Today, we tend to often treat women as sexual objects. And I think that this is they're just two sides of the same coin. It determines where the, the, the sexual ethics can change, but the objectification of women, I'd say, remains the same. This might, this might be a little bit pedantic, but you really focused in on Calvinism as uh, it, his view of total depravity as sort of the thing that's changing all of this. Um, at just one thought, like, you know, Luther also, like, he came to the realization that he himself was really wicked, and that kind of sparked the whole, his whole process of starting the Reformation. So I guess, can you explain a little bit why um, specifically Calvin's view um, is the one that's influencing as opposed, I mean, I haven't read a lot of Luther, but I know, I know that's a specific element of Reformed, but... No, that's a great question. So this is, you know, where you can, you know, especially if you're a theology nerd, you can split hairs on this. But I generally talk about Calvinism and Reformed theology as this. They're synonymous. They're not. Um, but in, the, in this case, I use the term Calvinism and not Reformed theology because Calvinism is the branch of Reformed theology that has the greatest impact on England during the reigns of Queen Elizabeth and King James. Um, a lot of people in England who have to flee uh, Queen Mary's reign when she tries to bring back Catholicism and she starts persecuting Protestants in this, you know, the era that's uh, encapsulated in Fox's Book of Martyrs. A lot of them go to Geneva. They hang out. Actually, I discovered this. My, one of my relatives actually fled under Mary's reign and went and worked on the Geneva Bible. Uh, my other relatives were actually actually Catholic, and they were persecuted by, so I'm, I occup, my family is influenced by both sides of this. It's very interesting. So you have all these Protestants who flee to Geneva. They're influenced by Calvinism, and they bring that back. So you could find very similar views of human nature and depravity in Luther, Zwingli, other reformers. I think they, they all basically have an Augustinian view 
of sin and how it affects us. I use the term Calvinism to refer to that because I think Calvinism is who most of the English divines and theologians they would have had in mind when they were formulating these views. Yeah, so uh, I'm curious about how this sort of idea of um, beauty on the outside relating to innocence on the inside uh, relates to at least children. I mean, at least in Victorian times, we see angels being sort of as babies. Uh, <coughs> they have at least baby forms. Um, but as we see with traditional reformed uh, ideas, as Fody Bauckham likes to say it, uh, vi uh, babies are vipers and diapers. <laughs> so uh, it's just, it, yeah, I'm just curious about how the relate. That's a great question, you know, and now that I think about it, I don't know much about Renaissance ideas about children. Um, they're, you know, they're rarely represented in, in plays. We rarely see children, probably because of the conventions of the time. They had to have, ch often they had child actors or preteen boys, because they didn't allow women on the stage, because women are terrible, so you couldn't have them on the stage. So you'd have these, uh, these preteen boys playing female roles. So if you bring out young children, it kind of shatters the illusion. So you don't see a lot of children in Renaissance plays, which is interesting. So I actually don't know much about that, but I will just throw out some, uh, an interesting factoid is recently I went to an exhibit of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. They've digitally recreated it, and so there was this art exhibit in Charleston where you could go, and they've taken all the details of the Sistine Chapel, and they've enlarged them. So you can essentially, it's like you're walking on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, and you get to stare at all the details. And one of the things that I found really interesting is there are all these children that I, I couldn't, they're too small to notice when you go to Italy and see it, but they're all these biblical prophets, but rather than depict them as adults, Michelangelo depicts them as children. Children, and I don't know what that means. So I would, I would have a fee if you, if you want to research that, let me know. I'd love that. But I, I don't know much actually about Renaissance views of children. But I would imagine there probably is an idealized. It's, it's probably one of two things. There's this idealized view of children that they're all born glossy and innocent, or that children are vipers and diapers, and so you have to whip them into submission. I would imagine it's one. Of, probably you're going to find both of those extremes commonly taught in the culture. Uh, it very, you know, there are definitely manuals on raising your children, and they definitely maintain that idea that children should be seen and not heard, and that sort of you know thing. Okay, let's thank Dr. Jeffrey. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>